Master, don't you care that my sister has abandoned the kitchen to me? Tell her to lend me a hand. The master said, Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. One thing only is essential and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course and won't be taken from her. So it is written in the Holy Bible. May we be blessed to find meaning and understanding in these words. Now let us pray. Goddess of the sacred pause, please grant me the courage to lay aside swiftness and take up slowness, to embrace limitations as learning. Silence is stabilizing, waiting is worthy and sitting as divine. Goddess of the sacred pause, help me to know stillness as strength Patience is powerful and healing time as holy necessity. May it be so. So that prayer for sacred pauses by Molly Remmer was sent to me last week by a friend. And for some reason, it kind of stopped me in my tracks. It, it felt like it was the perfect antidote and affirmation for what I've been struggling with lately. And that is, Busy, 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 and work, work, work. You would think that during a pandemic, slowing down would be an easy thing to do. In fact, I remember saying a year ago when this all began that this pandemic shutdown was simply the universe's way of telling us to all slow down a bit. Take some time to reflect, reset, regenerate, and then maybe after some much needed rest, we connect. Now, initially, I did just that. I remember that I decided I would just embrace the relative peace and quiet of being home alone. I tried looking for things in my house that I often overlooked or just took for granted, like a painting or drawing on my wall, and then spent some time rediscovering them. I would sit in places I wouldn't ordinarily sit to get a different perspective. I remember just lying on my, on my back on the floor in different places in my house and noticing things I hadn't seen before and then trying to be in touch with the way it made me feel. Often it felt like going on a trip somewhere and discovering something new for the first time, even though it was there right under my nose all along. I also relished not being drawn into the inevitable drama of the lives of some of my friends. I began practicing and playing some new piano music, songs without words, which I hadn't done in ages. I read, reflected, meditated. I committed to regular exercise, tried to avoid overeating and drinking. I was really getting into and digging this introspective, quieter and slower pace until I got, well, bored. I wasn't really bored with what I was doing, but more so with not sharing my activities with others. I was missing the social interaction, even from my drama queen friends. So in typical, be careful what you ask for fashion, the always attentive goddess responded to my inner yearnings by preparing me a veritable social feast by way of the Zoom. And here we are, not only Zooming our lives away now, but using Zoom to figure out how we're gonna keep Zooming in the future when we're no longer tethered to our living rooms and our pajamas which brings up the question Aretha Franklin asked a long time ago, who's Zooming who? Well, I'll tell you. Besides Zooming with all of you, I Zoom with the Philadelphia Boys Choir twice a week. I Zoom with the clergy and residents at least once a week. 
I average Zooming with power of bucks entities twice a week. I have happy hour on Zoom. I do family happy birthday parties on Zooms. Doctor's appointments, funerals, Philadelphia Orchestra and opera company concerts, trade meetings, and the list goes on. They are all done on Zoom. And guess what? Bloom is just about Zoomed out. But despite all that, all this Zooming, which also has plenty of benefits, like the intimacy it engenders among us, as Steve recently pointed out, all this Zooming is just a reminder that no matter what the circumstances, it seems we humans can help getting caught up in the act of living and helping and being of service to others, and maybe even more so during a pandemic. It's also a reminder to me that we owe it to ourselves to stop now and then and take a pause, a sacred pause. One of the things I've noticed about my life is that despite my sometimes strong hesitancy to do certain things, providence often pulls me inexorably to a place or in a direction I didn't intend. A perfect example of that was my decision to go to an interfaith seminary. My original intention was to attend in order to study comparative religion, not to become a minister. However, once I started the program, I felt called to follow the ordination track. And uh, with the express, uh, which involved more work, but with the express purpose of learning the various spiritual languages so that I could be of service wherever I was called. Likewise, it was also never my intention to be on a pulpit on a regular basis. I was happy being a piano playing minister of music. But as fate would have it, Providence once again stepped in with some coaxing from Reverend, Reverend Lance Roberts and I ended up becoming one of the clergy in residence. Thankfully, being a part of this CIR team has been an unexpected joy, even with its added responsibilities. However, being responsible, I finally realized, also means being responsible for my own self-care, knowing my limits and boundaries, and also knowing when to say, no. Now, I really struggle with saying no at times, but in the last couple of weeks, I've been very intentional about doing just the things I really need to do and not everything I'm asked to do in order to maintain my sanity and my health. Consequently, this Lenten season has become one of relinquishing the need to be everything to all people. Unlike Martha, the busybody in our scripture reading, I don't feel compelled to do everything that needs to be done, but rather called to do just what I want to do, including stopping and taking a pause, and better yet, a sacred pause. I recently discovered that sacred pauses can come from unexpected places, even by way of Zoom. So a couple of weeks ago in my zestiness, I joined a zest session on Zoom that was facilitated by Christina. I joined several women in our congregation along with Grace Sana's daughter to learn how to do a vision board. Now I didn't know what it was all about, but ultimately for me, it ended up being a sacred pause. I think I was curious about the visioning thing, but I really didn't know what to expect. This was a crafty event. The gist of it was to look through magazines and newspapers and cut out images that resonated, resonated or appealed to you. And then using poster board, create a collage that in the end expresses your inner vision at that time. So if you look behind me, you'll see the result of my visioning that day. It's like I'll grab it, let's hold it. Uh, I happened to use an old tile that was lying around as my base. And I 
titled this Smile File. You can see here, right here, it says Smile File. I have to admit that I had absolutely no expectations of creating something artistic that I would like because I have no visual artistic skills. Most of my drawings would be great examples for kindergarten kids making refrigerator art. But lo and behold, when this was done, I actually liked it. A couple of things emerged that are natural to me, peace and love. It says, all you need is love in the center. And above it is an image of a clasped pair of black and white hands that belong to a bride and groom who met in a nursing home. There's also a reference to peace with an image of John Lennon at the bottom. But what was surprising to me is that this vision board mostly centers and upslips, uplifts strong women, and in particular, strong Black women who have overcome many changes. You'll see on here, Tina Turner, Mary J. Blige, Viola Davis, and the still stunning Sophia Loren. The messages that connect them are think positive, which is right here, and we can overcome anything. When I finished it and stepped back to look at it, I actually thought it was very cool. So getting back to Providence and its inexorable pull on me. Uh, you know, Michelle, it just dawned on me that maybe Providence might be holding sway over the clergy and residents. We didn't come up with the Lenten theme, but it's possible one might be organically emerging anyway. I don't know. But last week you lifted up women and I'm doing it today. I realized that for the last few months, I have been celebrating and championing women from my three daughters to Lexi, our techie, who's been doing a great job, to the Black women like Stacey Abrams and others who have been organizing and challenging the status quo, to Kamala Harris and all of the bold and sharp women who are part of the Biden administration, including a trans woman borrowed from the state of Pennsylvania to Dale and her pleasure class where last week she asked us to identify the women who have impacted our lives, which gave me the opportunity to remember where I came from and remember the women teachers who had a significant impact on the person I am today. My mom, my third grade teacher, Mrs. Schimmel, and my high school and college music teacher, Janet Yamra all wonderful, strong women who had to struggle against patriarchy to find their place in the sun. I dubbed them all goddesses. They know that given the opportunity, they can overcome anything. They know that might doesn't equal right. They know that love, compassion, goodwill and forgiveness matters. They know that truth matters. They know that bullies need love and nurturing. They know that it's important to remember who we are and where we came from. They know we come from the goddess and God of all possibilities. They know and honor the seasons of life. These goddesses know joy, sorrow, laughter, tears, disappointment, jubilation, defeat, victory, and yes, they know death and resurrection. They know, like Martha's sister Mary, when to take a sacred pause, when to be still and know. They know when to rest and try to absorb the wisdom of the universe that is constantly speaking to us. They know because they remember where they came from and what they're capable of doing. They know they can do absolutely anything and everything. 
Now, I don't really need to tell you that these are strange and challenging times, anxious times that breed restlessness. But rather than being restless, instead of giving up chocolate or swearing, why don't we remember what Jesus did and simply use this Lenten season as an opportunity to rest and renew? We need clear heads to discern fact from fiction. We need open minds and loving hearts to hear those with whom we might disagree. We need soul food to make our spirits dance. One thing only is essential and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course and won't be taken from her, says Jesus. I think those are wise words. We need the pause that refreshes and quenches our thirst. We need the pause that is tasty, that nourishes us and fills our souls. We need a sacred, so, a sacred pause. Can I get an amen? Huh? Okay. Well, anyway, I invite you to close your eyes and repeat this prayer for sacred pauses after me. Goddess of the sacred pause, please grant me the courage to lay aside swiftness. And to take up slowness. To embrace limitations as learning. Silence as stabilizing waiting as worthy and sitting as divine. Goddess of the sacred pause, help me to know stillness as strength, patience as powerful and healing time as holy necessity. Amen. Thank you.